be ashamed. People came on Pentecost to a Pentecostal church and then not get to experience Pentecost. In other words, we need to have our minds made up before we walk out of this building. We're going to do everything within our power to see the glory and the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost fall in this house. God wants somebody to be spirit filled this morning. God wants somebody to speak in tongues for the first time today. If you're a first time guest and happen to miss filling out your information on our iPad at the front door, we have a QR code that we can put on the screen here. All you have to do is just scan it and um, on your phone, that information will come up. You can fill it out at your discretion. That would help us a whole lot. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, a couple things in mind. God is at work here. The Holy Ghost is working. The Spirit of the Lord. We do want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your financial support of the Pentecostals of Deland. It's very, very seldom that we ever mention money at all. And we're not about to take up an offering here. We're just saying thank you to our church family for their continued support of our local church. Many are given online uh, online uh, pay. Uh, you can also go to our website. Uh, we also have a drop box at the back. Some send checks, some pay cash, however you do it. We just want you to know thank you for giving and supporting our local church. We appreciate that. Today is missions. And uh, so we thank you for your support of our missions program. And uh, we are going to be renewing our missions pledges later in the year. And um, we need to do that in order for us to stay on task with our present level of missionaries and the monthly outgo to them. And uh, so you work with us on that. Amen. Uh, I don't see them, but uh, we wanted to celebrate with Joseph and Faith Pitsky. They were married just this weekend at uh, Victoria Park. <clears throat> And uh, God bless them in Jesus' name. Why would I expect them to be here this weekend? <laughs> Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Well, God is good. At this time, we're going to dismiss youth and teen, ages 12 through 17. Also, kids' church, ages 7 through 11. We have kindergarten, ages 5 and 6. Beginners, two, three, and four, I think. I'm all confused. And then, of course, we have a toddler class for uh, those one and two. We also have a cry room for mothers with small babies. Um, our last room through both sets of double doors, down the hall, right before you go out the door to the right, uh, we have a cry room for you, and uh, we want you to be able to catch the, the service. We have a video feedback there on the monitor for that. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's stand to our feet. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I have some uh, <clears throat> mixed emotions here this morning uh, concerning my task, and um, uh, somehow I'm trying to meld together two, uh, two different approaches. I feel like we need to take a good look at um, the subject of uh, the spirit-filled life uh, from a doctrinal perspective and uh, the work of tongues in our lives and how that operates, but also uh, I want to be inspirational. So you pray for me and hopefully we can get our act together and uh, say what needs to be said. I'm looking at Acts chapter 2. I'm looking at verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 
That was a feast day for the Jewish people. It was the beginning of first fruits, another feast day. Uh, Pentecost means 50, 50 days after the Passover. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Been there for 10 days now. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to preach this morning on the subject. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Let's pray. God, right now, we know you're here in this house. We sense your presence. There's a mighty awareness, a flow of the Spirit. God, right now, we want to do exactly what you want us to do. For every single one of us, Lord, we want to be open. Lord, to the experience and also to the doctrine. I pray right now, Lord, that we might be able to receive this word and put it to work in our lives, that we might better understand. Let it be personal revelation to us. God, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. Today is... Pentecost Sunday. <clears throat> Every year, uh, this day is set aside by apostolic slash Pentecostal churches all across the world where we celebrate the outpouring of the Spirit of God 2,000 years ago at what we call the birth of the New Testament church. I read to you in your hearing what happened on that particular day. You need to know that prior to the ascension of Jesus into heaven, Jesus told his disciples to go gather in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost baptism, or what Jesus earlier in his ministry had described as the comforter, the arrival of the comforter. And after abiding in this upper room for 10 days, the Spirit of God suddenly fell in that room and descended upon those 120 believers gathered there. From that Spirit empowered launching pad, the church was birthed and grew exponentially over the years to come. Now, you may or may not be aware that there is plenty of historical evidence for people speaking in tongues throughout the entire last 2,000 years, or what we would call this entire grace dispensation. Speaking in tongues is not a relatively recent event that began at Topeka, Kansas in 1901. But instead, you need to know it, you need to hear it, historically, People have been receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues throughout the centuries. If you want more information on those particulars, contact our church office. We can give you that Bible study. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, I remember vividly the article, Life Magazine listed the top 100 events over the last 1,000 years. And interestingly, Life Magazine put the Pentecostal experience or the rise of Pentecostalism at number 68 
out of a hundred events over the last thousand years. Well, I've got a little bone to pick with that. As far as I'm concerned, Pentecostalism should have been number one on the list, not number 68. Because uh, the time where the printing press uh, was invented was a secular event, not a spiritual event. But when you talk about Pentecostalism, when you talk about the power of God invading people's lives, uh, it is not just a historical event, a secular event, but it is a spiritual event of eternal nature. Why would I say that? Because of passage like, passages like Romans chapter 8 verse 9 that says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So in other words, there are consequences here. There's significance here. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to open your spirit for the next 30, 40 minutes. And I also want you to put your thinking cap on because we're going to do a lot of Bible reading because we need to look doctrinally at the subject of speaking in tongues. We all get it. We all know over the centuries, there has been much confusion connected with the subject of being born of the Spirit or filled with the Spirit and this business of speaking in tongues. Some organizations, they teach that speaking in tongues is not a valid experience for today. Those organizations, they contend that speaking in tongues actually died out with the last apostle, John, in Revelation. And they also say speaking in tongues died out with the canonizing or the compiling of the New Testament books. And of course, we don't believe that. There are others that teach that one is filled with the Spirit when he confesses Christ or believes on Christ. We feel a little different than that. Then there are still others who teach that there's a difference between being filled with the Spirit when you confess Christ and being baptized in the Holy Ghost when you speak in tongues. And we feel differently than that. Then there are some that teach while tongues is a valid experience and obviously it happens today, not every believer can expect to speak in tongues. It's a gift that's only given to some. Well, we don't believe that either. Can you begin to understand the confusion? The apostolic movement contends that speaking in tongues is a historic supernatural event that biblically accompanies being filled with the Spirit or receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the standard, normal, biblical expectation. So let's let's walk through this. Just what does it mean to be Spirit-filled? Let's go through some scripture here. To receive the promise of the Father, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, or to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, I can show you from the scripture, are exactly the same one experience. Let me give them to you. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 4. The Bible says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. That's chapter 1, verse 4. The very next verse. Let me read it to you. And John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. So, Verse 4 is calling it the promise of the Father. Verse 5 is calling it being baptized with the Holy Ghost. And then when you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, when the Spirit fell, the Bible says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. So we have the promise of the Father. We have being baptized in the Holy Ghost. We also have being filled with the Holy Ghost. And obviously relating to identify and speaking 
of the same experience. Isn't that odd? Let's go a little further here. You go into Acts 10. You find that the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard the word. And in Acts chapter 10, you find the Holy Ghost falling. You find the Holy Ghost being poured out. You also find receiving the Holy Ghost, describing the same exact experience. Let's read them. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Now, Keep in mind that this is where Cornelius and his household first received the baptism of the Spirit. We're talking about the first Gentiles. The very next verse, verse 45, says, And they of the circumcision which believed were also astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 10, 44, the verse before, it says the Holy Ghost fell. Verse 45, it's being described as the the gift of the Holy Ghost being poured out. And then, of course, uh, when you go to uh, verse 47, we find again this being referred to the same experience as having received the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 10, verse 47, can these men forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So in other words, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the Holy Ghost falling on you, uh, uh, receiving the Holy Ghost or, uh, or being poured out upon you, it's still relating to the same exact experience. And then, of course, the icing on the cake is there in uh, chapter 11, verse 15, where Peter later in Jerusalem is reciting back to the rest of the disciples what happened with the Gentiles in Cornelius' house. And he says, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, you say, why all these verses? Because these are different ways The scriptures describe this one supernatural experience. And if you're not careful, you can pick it apart and try to divvy it out and divide it up. And I'm telling you, it's the one self-same experience. Some people would say, please, would you please make up your mind, Peter? Which is it? Did the Holy Ghost fall on them or not? Was the Holy Ghost poured out on them or was it not? Make up your mind. Did they receive the Holy Ghost or did they not? Were they baptized in the Holy Ghost or were they not? And you know what the answer to those questions are? Yes. In other words, uh, whether you're talking about the Holy Ghost being poured out on you, the being filled with the Holy Ghost, being baptized in the Holy Ghost, it's the one self same experience. You need to get that. You need to see that. Because I'm telling you, there are entire organizations out there that are confused on that subject. To have the Holy Ghost fall on you. To have the Holy Ghost poured out on you. To receive the Holy Ghost. To be baptized with the Holy Ghost. To be filled with the Holy Ghost. These are all synonymous phrases describing the same supernatural experience. So, Pastor Howard, you trying to be ugly here? No, I'm just trying to help us understand. So then there's the question, just what happens when we are spirit-filled? We have to, again, go back to the Word of God. You know, when you receive the Holy Ghost, there is this accompanying euphoria. You might describe it. There's this inner peace that comes on you. There is this joy that that escapes your ability to describe it and explain it. When you feel it and sense it, it's at that moment when all pain and guilt and condemnation and and shame is, is somehow swept away. 
When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, nobody's going to have to tell you that you received it. Honey, you're going to know it when Jesus takes up residence inside you. Something changes. You know, the Bible describes this experience as righteousness, peace, and joy. In the Holy Ghost. Let me read it for you. Romans chapter 14 verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But it's righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So here you are at the moment. You are spirit filled when you receive God's spirit. God takes over so much of you. Mentally. Spiritually. And even physically. You've never seen people shout. And the spirit, have you? God even takes over spiritually. So much of you, God takes over. That God even takes over your tongue. Which, by the way, is the last member of your physical body to yield to God. Why would you say that? Because of passages like James chapter 3 verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You know it as well as I do. Long after you can avert your eyes and control your your hearing and control your hands and feet where you're going and what you're doing, this little red devil behind the pearly white gates has a way of slipping out and you saying things that you later have to regret and apologize for. The tongue's the last member of the body to yield to God. Why should it surprise us that God would take the last member of your body to yield to God and show you and prove to you and those around you that he has taken total, complete control over your body, soul, and spirit by speaking through you in a language that you've never been taught. Well, that makes sense. At the spirit infilling, you're speaking in tongues. As the spirit moves on you, you are speaking in tongues as evidence that God is now dwelling within. It's not gibberish. It's not stuttering. But my Bible describes it as a language, earthly or heavenly, that's been given to you by God. Speaking in tongues. And then you look at the subject of tongues from a Pentecostal perspective. We like to go to the book of Acts because the book of Acts is the history of the New Testament church. If you want to know what the New Testament believed, go to the book of Acts. If you want to know how the New Testament church was organized, go to the book of Acts. If you want to see what the New Testament preachers preached in the dispensation of grace, go to the book of Acts. We go to the book of Acts because it plainly states or infers that people who received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, they spoke in tongues. You know, Luke wrote the book of Acts. And Luke evidently was inspired by God to write extensively in detail about four instances where people were converted to the faith, believed on Christ, and what happened to them when the Spirit fell on them. These four instances where there's all this detail just so happens to fall upon four subjects or four classes of people. There in Acts chapter 2, it describes they spoke in tongues. Well, that was to the Jews in Jerusalem. We also know that the Bible specifically says that they spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 8, and that's when the, uh, the, the mix of Gentiles and Jews were at, and of course, it's Samaria, were filled with the Spirit, Acts 8. And then there was Cornelius and his household. And there's this detail in the Scripture concerning what happened to them when they were Spirit-filled. And of course, they spoke with tongues. 
And why would it be important to Luke that that detail is given? It's because this is the first time that the Gentiles are filled with the Spirit. And the evidence that they have been filled with the Spirit is that they speak in tongues. And then, of course, uh, there's one more occasion in Acts chapter 19 when disciples of John... They come in contact with Paul the Apostle at Ephesus and it's there by Paul's tutelage and teaching that these men are rebaptized and are filled with the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues and alter their doctrinal view in order to accommodate the greater revelation they have just received. Luke mentions these four instances. Why? Because it shows all four classes of people in that day and in that time. If you want to know what Luke was doing, he's trying to emphasize and show everybody who wants to know when you you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can expect to speak in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Now let me say this. You know, we read all kinds of Christian books for the purpose of hoping somehow we might be reassured that we have been Spirit-filled. We want preachers and pulpits to tell us that we have been filled with the Spirit. We want friends and and relatives and saints uh, to agree with us that we have also been born again. But instead of all of that, why don't we just let God tell us? When we have been born again, when we have been filled with the Spirit, when we have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, why don't we just let God show us? Let God tell us. And He does, honey. Because when you get the Holy Ghost, God moves on you and you speak in a language that you've never been taught. What is that? That's the evidence. That's the proof. No man can dispute it. You go in your Bible, you go back into Acts chapter 10. What did these six Jewish Christians from Jerusalem who came with Peter to Joppa and then follow Peter to Cornelius' household where the first Gentiles received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? They come with him. They come to see and they come to hear. And what did they see and what did they hear that convinced them that these people were now spirit filled? Well, Let me read it to you. Glad you ask. Acts chapter 10 verse 44. While Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed, that's the six, were astonished. As many as came with Peter. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues. And magnify God. That's how they knew they had been spirit filled. And so then there's the next question. So what should be our attitude towards speaking in tongues? In light of the scripture, in spite of no matter how you describe it or explain it or express it, it's the same experience. I think our attitude should not be one of, well, do I have to? Do I have to speak in tongues? Think about it. Our attitude should not be something that I got to do. It really ought to be something that I get to do. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because God's not going to give you a gift that you don't want. In other words, spiritual hunger precedes the spirit outpouring. So if you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you're going to speak in tongues when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because you asked God for it, you believed God for it, and you thanked God for it. God's not going to sneak up on you in the middle of the night and you wake up sitting bolt upright in bed talking in tongues. God's not going to bypass your conscience or your will and give you the Holy Ghost whether you want it or not. He just doesn't operate that way. You don't have to worry about the Spirit of God jumping on you and making you do things against your will or things to make you look foolish. 
You don't need to worry about coming into a Pentecostal service and God making you look foolish because you run the aisles or jump up and down or dance in the spirit or speak in tongues. You're never going to have to worry about God going against your personal will. God is not going to give you a gift that you do not want. There has to be a spiritual thirst for this experience. That's why Jesus in John chapter 7, verse 37, he said, in that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. If you're thirsty, that experience of rivers of living water flowing through you is available. But what is it about? What is he talking about? But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, there's an experience awaiting you. There's an experience coming where you're going to be filled up from the inside out. And it's going to be like an artesian well that's going to flow out of you. But you can't have it yet because Jesus hasn't gone by way of death and burial and resurrection. So in other words, we have to have a desire to be filled with the Spirit. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. You won't go away empty-handed nor disappointed. Can you imagine a son or a daughter whining to their father? They're trying to give that boy, trying to give that girl a surprise gift. Ah, dad, do I have to? Can you imagine a child telling their parents who are trying to give him or her an expensive gift? Can you imagine them saying, well, I'm not sure if I want it or not. It's in a wrapped package. What is it? They want to ask first before they open it. Well, I like it. What if I don't like it, Dad? Do I have to keep it, Dad, if I don't like it? I don't know any kids that's going to do that. I'll tell you what that kid's going to do. That kid's going to snatch that package out of dad's hands and can't unwrap it fast enough. Why? Because he wants to see what's inside. He wants what's on the inside of it. That is the way we need to be with the spirit-filled life. You don't have to worry about God sneaking up on you. But if you're thirsty, if you're hungry... Devil, watch out because we're coming through looking for that experience. God's not going to give you something you don't want, that you don't like. Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 11, verse 11 says this. Hey, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, would he give him a stone? No. No. If he were to ask for a fish, would he give him, instead of a fish, would he give him a serpent? Absolutely not. Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? It's ridiculous. And if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost? To them that ask him. What are you saying? I'm saying that God is at work and God desires to fill all of us with the power of God. He desires to fill every one of us with the gift of the Holy Ghost. He wants all of us to experience glossolalia or speaking in tongues as that proof or evidence that he's taken up permanent residence inside. But it's going to happen because you want it to happen. It's, it's going to happen because you believe the word of God. Can you begin to understand why so many people, Christians in our time, they're so confused over the subject of tongues that they don't even bother with it. They don't even fool with it. And all the while, they are missing out on a glorious experience and relationship with the Lord God Almighty. 
Thank God for believing in Christ. But that's not where you need to stop. Thank God that you've confessed Christ with your mouth. And you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That's wonderful. But don't stop there. Thank God that you were baptized in water. But don't stop there. Go ahead and get the rest of what God has done for you. Go ahead and get the rest of the benefits of the resurrection. Let's stand to our feet. I don't know how to explain it any better than this. Has anybody ever heard the phrase... Hydrotherapy. You ever heard that phrase? That's where people with disabilities can get in a pool and suddenly they can do things in the pool that they can't do on land. A woman by the name of Linda can't remember her last name. Penny Linder. There we go. Penny Lender, for 26 years, had been dealing with the ravaging effects of MS, multiple sclerosis in her body. Extreme pain, discomfort, not even able to walk. This terrible neurological disease. And what she found is that there was relief in hydrotherapy. Go to the pool, get lowered into the pool. And she describes it as such, I quote. I don't feel disabled in the water, she said. I feel stronger and more healthy in the pool because I can do things there that I couldn't dream of doing on dry land. So in other words, hydrotherapy offers this wonderful sense of freedom to disabled individuals who otherwise would never have a chance to experience that euphoric experience. Because when you're in the water disabled, you are pleasantly surprised by this feeling of weightlessness. And once you get in the water, gravity releases its hold on your joints and bones. And all of a sudden, pain and discomfort is alleviated and is removed because the pressure is now gone, allowing you to float and and stand and stretch and maybe even swim in ways that would be impossible if you were standing on dry land. When you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I don't know how to tell you, you feel liberated and loosed from the crippling feelings of low self-esteem and worthlessness. Suddenly you begin to realize there is somebody on the planet that loves me just like I am. With all of my quirks and with all of my issues, there is somebody who loves me and accepts me as I am. I can't explain it any better. There's this pain of guilt and condemnation and shame is swept away as if you were in a the current of a stream suddenly you find yourself being able to float and move and enjoy freedom that you were not allowed just a few minutes before. I'm telling you, when you get the Holy Ghost, uh, you feel like you can tackle hell with a water pistol. 
When you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're no longer afraid of the devil. When you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there's a freedom and a liberty to do things you've never done before. I never ran the aisles until I talked in tongues. I never rolled in the floor until I talked in tongues. I never was expressive and excessive in my expressions until I received the Holy Ghost. And now today, without apology, I want to run with the best of you. I want to shout with the best of you. I want to worship God with the best of you. Why? Because I got the Holy Ghost. You get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There's this warm, fluid feeling of peace and joy and liberty that begins running through you. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, your hands are lifted and your face is lifted upward and you hear yourself saying strange things. There's a peace and a joy and a liberty that floods your soul and you start feeling all of that junk, all of that negativity, all of that doubt, all of those fears. It's almost like they're getting carried away with the current. When you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Cliff, can't explain it. But suddenly, you are given a level of willpower that delivers you and frees you up from debilitating habits and vices and sins that before... You couldn't give up or change. But you know when you get up from the altar, whatever I had hounding me, whatever was on my back, whatever load I was carrying, it's gone. I'm free. I'm liberated. I'm going to be a different person the rest of my life. That, my friend, is experienced in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the greatest part of that experience of being Holy Ghost baptized Spirit filled. The Spirit poured out on you. However you want to describe it. It's the same experience. The greatest part is feeling this liberating power of God resident within you. And you sense and feel a, an intimacy, a closeness with the Lord God that you haven't felt before. And it is intimate because your human spirit and God's Holy Spirit is now merging and converging. And this is why when you're spirit filled, this is why suddenly you feel differently about sin. Because now you're tapping into God's conscience instead of your human conscience. You're starting to see things from God's perspective rather than your perspective. And things that you used to do and things that you used to be involved in that would make your head swim and your face turn red before. You don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because your spirit is merging with God's spirit. You're beginning to see your life, your choices, your decisions from God's perspective. You pick up on God's conscience. Another thing that happens is you pick up on God's willpower. There's this merging of the power of God in your life. You're now able to say no to things that you couldn't help but say yes to before. Vices, vices, habits, and addictions that had you bound. Things you tried a hundred times to give up and walk away from but never could. But you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all bets are off. Because now you have the power and the will to do what God's asking you to do. Now, that all having been said, who would not 
want to speak in tongues? Who would not want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? Who would not want to be delivered from the debilitating, crippling ravages of sin? Again, the book of Acts. People say, I wish you Pentecostals would get out of the book of Acts. Well, I wish they'd get in the book of Acts. You go in the book of Acts. Peter asked the disciples of John two specific questions. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And then the second question was, how are you baptized? Isn't it interesting that in most apostolic churches, when, it, when the rubber meets the road, that's the two questions we're asking. Have you received the Holy Ghost? Oh, it's great that you're believing. It's great that you read your Bible. It's great that you confess Christ. It's great that you believe in the death and burial and resurrection. But have you been spirit filled? Have you spoken in tongues? And now we're caught up in the confusion that's scattered in churches all across America about the subject of tongues. When you get the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. How can you stand there and say that, Pastor? I can stand there and say that because that's what the Bible says. And so on Pentecost Sunday, 2022, I'm asking you, precious people today, I'm asking you the same exact question. Acts chapter 19, verse 2. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? They said, Well, we haven't as much even heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 19, verse 3 and 5. Peter asked, Paul asked the second question. He said unto them, Under what then were ye baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Then said Paul, Verily, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that should follow, come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And then the Bible says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I asked two questions. Pastor, I'm a believer, and I know you are. And it's wonderful that you are. And I thank God that you are. But is it just possible that God has another layer, another level of revelation and blessing on you? That because of confusion, because of bad teaching, because of the past, because of other pulpits and ministries, you're not even sure that it's been available to you. I'm here to tell you the Holy Ghost is for everybody. I wish I had the time and I don't. Some people teach that, well, the Holy Ghost is a valid experience, but not everybody receives it. Not everybody speaks in tongues. And then they take you to 1 Corinthians 12, where there's the description of nine gifts of the Spirit, one of them being diverse kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues that goes along with it. Not everybody receives that gift. I get it. I accept it. I have no problem with that. But that doesn't mean that everybody doesn't speak in tongues when they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost as evidence of having been spirit filled. You can speak in tongues having received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can speak in tongues in your normal prayer life and never possibly be picked or anointed by God to exercise the gift, diverse kinds of tongues, giving a message in a church environment. It's two separate subjects. But our church world is confused on the subject. In other words, God wants everybody to speak in tongues. God doesn't want everybody to have the nine gift of the Spirit, diverse kinds of tongues. But God wants everybody to be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to give you a four-point formula very quick as to how easy it is to be Spirit-filled. God wants everybody to be Spirit-filled. God wants everybody to speak in tongues. Well, what do I have to do? First thing, you have to repent. 
You have to ask God to forgive you of all of your past. The things that God brings to your mind, things that has grieved God, things that you know you've done against the word of God. You have to truly, genuinely repent of those sins. Ask God to forgive you. Another thing you have to do is you have to believe that God wants everyone to be spirit filled. God wants everyone to be filled with the spirit speaking in tongues. You say, well, Pastor Hires, I've been looking for the Holy Ghost for a while, but it just hasn't happened to me. I just haven't spoken in tongues. And it may very well be that somewhere in your past you've been fed information that not everybody speaks in tongues. And so they're all, there's this little doubt in the back of your mind as to maybe I'm one of those people that God will never bless with Holy Ghost baptism. There are people sitting on pews all across America that believe exactly that. I must not be one of those chosen In other words, you need to believe God wants me to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to believe that because doubt will keep you from receiving that. The third thing you need to do, and I'm hurrying, you need to believe that God wants you to have the Holy Ghost right now. See, that's another thing that people are taught. That's not true and not biblical. Oh, yep, the Holy Ghost baptism is available. It is valid. Uh, the Holy Ghost baptism uh, is for some people. But you're only going to receive the Holy Ghost when He gets good and ready to fill you. That's not true. I don't know how to say it. God has been ready to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But you got to believe that. Because if you've been taught and you've believed all your life that God's only going to give me the Holy Ghost when He gets good and ready, that doubt, well, went to the altar, prayed for it, didn't happen. must not be my time. The truth of the matter is you need to believe God wants me to have the Holy Ghost. God wants everyone to have the Holy Ghost. And God wants me to have the Holy Ghost right now. You believe those two things. You repent of your sins. And when you come to an altar, lift your hands and begin to love and worship the Lord. I promise you, God is ready to fill you with the Holy Ghost. So that you speak in tongues. Unlike any time in your past. I'm asking a couple of our church leaders to come around the front. I'm asking Marcus and Jimmy and Bianca. There's a few more people, Brother Craig Abney, Brother Cliff Hires. I'm asking them to come down the front and just face you. And here's what I'm saying. These people are ready to pray with you. And the rest of us in just a minute are going to come down around the front and we're going to crank up the music and we're going to worship the Lord. And if you're here this morning... You're a believer, and thank God that you have. I talk with God, and God talks with me. I thank God that that happens to you. But God's got something more for you. God wants you to be filled with the Spirit, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Every one of these people have proven their ministries as to helping you to move through those objections, gain the faith, let go and worship God, Turn loose emotionally, and in just a few minutes, you can be speaking in tongues. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to lift our hands and pray. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, every single one of us in this building, Lord, we're sincere people. We're genuine people, or we wouldn't be here. We're believers, or we wouldn't be here. We've confessed you. We believe.